grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for being who you are. You are the great God. You are the one who has revealed yourself in your word, the Bible. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and for all that he came and did among us and then suffering and dying for us. So we thank you for that, Jesus, and we certainly thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our advocate and our our counselor, our advocate, our guide, our teacher. And we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed God. Lord, I pray that you would anoint my tongue to declare the word that you've given to me today. We pray that all of us would be able to understand it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we begin Luke chapter 13. So, it's kind of an interesting chapter in that there are so many things going on. And some of it really just, at the beginning, ties with the end of it. So let's get into it here. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We go, what in the world is going on here? Well, guess what? We don't know. The commentaries, one of the things that the commentaries do, uh, they rely heavily upon the Jewish historian Josephus. And Josephus is silent on this matter. So we don't know what was going on or what Pilate had done to mingle the Galileans' blood with their sacrifices. But apparently the Galileans, if we look at this at face value, Galileans had come from Galilee to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices at the temple. But while they were doing that, Pilate killed them. So their blood was shed at the same time as the, the animal's blood was being shed. And so they were asking that question. They were just telling him about this, you know. And Jesus says, you know, do you suppose that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Well, apparently Josephus has said that people living in Galilee at this time were pretty bad. But were they worse sinners than anybody else that they should die in this manner? He says, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And that's interesting. You will all likewise perish. You will all in the same manner, in the same kind of way, perish if you do not repent. That's interesting. Jesus is looking for them to repent. If they don't, they will, they will perish in a likewise manner that these people had perished. And, uh, and then on the 18 whom the tower in Siloam fell, they killed you know, were they worse sinners than anybody else in Jerusalem? He says, no, but unless you too repent, you will all likewise perish. And so what is Jesus doing here? Now I wonder, now we don't have anything in the text, so this is speculation on my part. But I wonder if Jesus is referring somehow to the fact that had the people in Jerusalem at that time repented, I wonder if the destruction of Jerusalem would have ever happened. Was he looking for repentance on a you know, Jerusalem-wide scale or maybe uh, a wide scale throughout all of Israel? 
and that maybe Jerusalem, that destruction that came upon it in 70 AD might have been averted. Now, why do I say that? Well, we know that when Jonah went to Nineveh and preached, 40 days and this city is going to become toast. It's going to be overrun. He didn't say anything about repentance. The people from the king on down took it upon themselves. The king ordered that everybody and even the animals would fast food and water for three whole days. And he would do it too. He would put on sackcloth and you know, pour ashes on his head. And so God relented of the evil that he was going to do because they repented. Jonah didn't say anything about repentance, and this will be a reprieve for you. No, they said, maybe if we do this, God will relent. Jesus is saying, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish in the same kind of way. So I'm wondering if he's thinking, Jesus is saying, you don't know what's coming, but if you do this, maybe this would be averted. Now, that's speculation on my part. But there's a reason why I say this. Let's jump to the last, verse 34. And this is why I'm going to tie it together here. It says here, Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. You know, when I read this, I'm, you know, I know Jesus is saying it, but I'm, re I'm, I'm, I'm sensing the heart of the Father saying, I wanted to gather you to myself, but you were not willing. So he goes on to say, see, okay, the text reads, see, your house is left to you desolate. The actual Greek does not have the word desolate in there. Okay? And so the sentence should read, see, your house is left to you. Your house is, in other words, God's house now is left to you because God's leaving. Has God done this before left the, the temple? Yes. During Ezekiel's day, Ezekiel saw a vision of the Lord leaving the temple. Why? Because of the sinfulness of God's people. So it would not at all be new for Jesus to be saying something like this. Since he's not saying, my house, my house is left to you desolate. No, he's saying, your house is left to you desolate. Or your house is left to you because I'm leaving it. I'm abandoning it because of your sins. So he says, so that's what I'm thinking. He may be looking at that 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and maybe it just could have been averted had the people repented. I don't know that for a fact, because we know that it didn't happen and Jerusalem was destroyed. So, but he says, you know, other people are not worse sinners than other people just because they die horrendously. All right, don't go comparing yourself to other people. So, you know, if we're going to compare ourselves to anything, we've got to compare ourselves to the Word of God and God's standard. And God's standard, we don't measure up. So, anyway. So, anyway, that's where we are on that one. I'm just like, ah, you know. And he spoke this parable. And this parable actually ties in with what he has just said. Okay? He spoke a parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he, meaning the keeper of the vineyard, answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that you can cut it down. Again, we don't know this for a fact, but you know, look for three years. Jesus had a three-year ministry. 
And so this man had a fig tree. He had planted it in his vineyard. That was a common practice to put a fig tree in a vineyard. And so the man who owned the vineyard came looking for fruit. And there wasn't any. Well, if you've got a fruit tree, you want fruit on it. If you've got a vegetable garden, you want vegetables. It's just the way it is, right? So he says, I've been looking for fruit all this time. And it's not there. So I wonder, going back to those initial passages, is Jesus saying, you know, repent, or you likewise will also perish. In other words, what he may be saying is repent and bear the fruit of repentance, because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people to bear fruit in their lives. And we know that from John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He says, you know, my father is the vine dresser, and he goes looking for fruit. And the, and the, the parts of the vine that aren't bearing fruit, he cuts off. And so he's saying here, hey, this guy looks for fruit, doesn't find any. He wants that tree cut down because it hasn't been bearing fruit. So is Jesus saying to begin with, repent and bear the works of repentance. Don't say it with your lips. Do it with your life. I mean, you have to ask, you know, what would a, what would a life of repentance look like? A life of repentance would look like an alcoholic or a smoker or a drug addict saying, I'm going to quit all those and actually do it. Okay, that's fruit of repentance. All right? You know, don't just say it, yeah, I'm going to do it, and then don't do anything about it. When you say it, you do it. That's the fruit of repentance. So he's looking for fruit. And the vine, the keeper of the vineyard, he says, oh, wait, hold on. Let me dig around it. Let me add manure to it, and let's just see what happens. Let me, let me just spend some time with it for another year, for another little time. So if, if it bears fruit, good, fine, great, wonderful. If it doesn't, then you can cut it down. Is he referring then eventually to Jerusalem that would be cut down and the temple destroyed? Could be. We just don't know for a fact. But Jesus looks for fruit in a person's life. That's what he does in everybody's life. Moving on. Verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to himself or to himself and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, not on the Sabbath day. Now, isn't that interesting? There's nothing that said that this woman came seeking healing on the Sabbath. Jesus saw her in the crowd took notice of her. <laughs> the Lord had a quick answer. He's a hypocrite. I think he's talking directly to that particular synagogue ruler because that word hypocrite is singular. Singular. Hypocrite. And then he goes on to say, Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? Of course. They're not going to let the donkey or the ox or anything else go without water for the day just because it's the Sabbath. They understand that every single creature needs water to live. So, what's interesting about that 
And so how often is it that, you know, we can see somebody else's splinter, but we don't see the log in our own eye. We don't see what we're doing. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. So he said, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? First off, I love the fact that he called her a daughter of Abraham. I imagine that after 18 years of doing this, for 18 years, I had an uncle that was like that, only he was to the side. Long time. But anyway, he called her daughter of Abraham. And that probably had, first off, it had an impact on everybody in the synagogue there, but on her in particular, for having been bent over that long. You know, I don't know about you, but she probably, every now and then it crossed her mind, woe is me. Do I even belong in Israel because of the fact that I, I can't even say I stand up straight? You know, have a little pity party there. But he says, your daughter of Abraham, she belonged. He said, shouldn't she, having been bound by Satan for 18 long years, be loosed from that bondage? Jesus came to loose those that were in bondage. And she was in bondage. So, again, he didn't make friends that day with the ruler of the synagogue. He was there to touch this woman's life. In verse 17, he says, And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. And then he went on. Seems to be a different subject. He says, what is the kingdom of God like? To what shall I compare it? And he answers his question. He said, it is like a mustard seed, which a man took and put in his garden. And it grew and became a large tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Again, he said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, 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 till it was all leavened. The first thing is this, is that when you consider, you know, a little measure of leaven in a, you know, in flour or whatever you're really putting it in, or a mustard seed. The mustard seed was the smallest of all garden seeds. And we know if anybody bakes or has ever made bread that you put a little bit of leaven in, but eventually that whole dough is going to rise because the leavening impacts the entire loaf. What he's saying here is, is the kingdom of God, it has small beginnings but it will grow. It will grow. You know, the first one was like, hey, it became a large tree, and even the birds of the air could make nests in its branches, take shelter and shade from it. And that leavening and that measures of the meal just filled it all up. I think of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and he didn't understand it. But one part of the dream had to do with the kingdom of God. Because Nebuchadnezzar uh, dreamt of various kingdoms that would rise over the course of many centuries. But the last kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar saw was the kingdom of God. That a stone was cut out of the mountain but not by hand. So it's not a, an earthly. Mankind didn't do this. So it was a stone cut out of this mountain, not by hand, that was thrown onto all of the other kingdoms of the world, and they, he destroyed this rock, destroyed all the kingdoms of the world, but itself 
filled eventually the entire earth. So what he's saying is, you know, the kingdom of God may seem to be imperceptible at times. In our midst, you know, we wonder what's going on with the kingdom of God because the kingdom of the, of the, the enemy, the darkness and everything seems to so in our faces. Jesus said, don't worry. It's growing. It's going to fill the earth. Verse 22, And he went through all the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward them. Then one said to him, we don't know who that one is. It doesn't say one of his disciples. It says one. Certainly one person following with him. Lord, are there few who are saved? Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. There are an awful lot of people today that really have it wrong. When asked, are you going to go to heaven? Well, yeah, I think, I think so because I'm pretty good. Pretty good isn't going to cut it. Remember that standard I talked about earlier? The standard God has? God's standard is perfection. And beyond that, if we don't come in the door through the one he has made available to us, we're not going to make it. So anytime we think we're going to do it on our own, it isn't going to happen. It is like the man who went into the king's wedding banquet, but he came in on his own clothes. It doesn't cut it. We have to do things God's way. And God's way is the narrow way. It is not the world's way. In the world, we tend to compare ourselves to everybody else. No, we've got to, com you know, we've got to compare ourselves to what God has said in his word and what he has taught. How do we measure up to what God has said? Oh, we do that, we all fall short. Like Paul said, there's none righteous, no, not one. So he says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. And you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where you are from. You, see, you know, having a, a, a shirt sleeve relationship with Jesus, or I rubbed elbows with him at some time or another, that doesn't work. I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but even sitting in the church pew forever and ever, amen, that doesn't work either. It has to be that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It isn't about, I rubbed, I rubbed elbows with you every now and then. I even, I even sat at a dinner, to, a dinner with you. I heard you teach. Well, there were a lot of people hearing Jesus teach. That isn't it. Did we take the next step? And say, Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. I'm going to hold on to him and not let go. Lord, Lord, let us in. No, we've got to do it his way. In fact, the people who he's not going to let in, who thought they were going to make it, he calls them workers of iniquity. Workers of lawlessness. Why are they workers of lawlessness? Because they didn't do things God's way. And if we're not doing things God's way, God's way, everything is lawlessness. God's way is righteousness. World's way, our way, no. She says, I tell you, I do not know you. I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets and the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south and, south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, 
There are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. Jesus is talking to Jews right now in this time here, in this passage. And, you know, he's on his way to Jerusalem, or about to be on his way to Jerusalem. And the Jews were thinking since they had this, they had the covenants, they thought for sure they were in like Flynn. No. You know, you don't get in just because you have a membership card or a little, or a little be, a button on your sleeve or anything, or, you know, on your lapel or whatever. No. Since some are going to be first who they thought were going to be last, and those are last that are going to be first, and it's like the Gentiles are going to get in in front of you because they paid attention and they believed in me. Since the prostitutes and the harlots, they're going to get in ahead of you, Pharisees. They're going to get in ahead of you because they grasped this message and they clung to it by faith. Now, the next little section is really good. Well, and they're all good. It says, on that very day, some Pharisees came saying to him, isn't that interesting? I guess they were some Pharisees who liked him. Said, some Pharisees came to him saying, get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. If it's Herod who wants to kill him, he's in the region of Galilee, because that's where Herod had jurisdiction. So get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, the text says, I shall be perfected. I don't really like that particular translation. Perfected to us, you know, to, it, the word to us says, there's something in Jesus that isn't perfect. no. Jesus is perfect just the way he is. You know, he didn't have to strive to be perfect. The text is, the word, the root word is teleos or telos, and it can be translated finished. Okay? Or I've come to the end of what I came to do. That's what it means. So, go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons of her, perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I shall be finished. Not before then. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. The good takeaway from this is the fact that he was on assignment from God, and Herod wasn't going to be able to touch him. Because he was on assignment from God. God had him covered. So it didn't matter, didn't matter if the, you know, if the, the people in Nazareth wanted to throw him over the brink of a hill or a cliff. He was covered because he was on God's assignment. And until that assignment had gotten to the point where he would be relinquished over to the enemy in Jerusalem, until that happened, nothing was going to touch him. He was protected. But he said... Nevertheless, I must journey today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem didn't have a very good reputation for prophets and teachers of God. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. They're supposed to be the people of God. Israel's supposed to be the people of God. Why in the world are they stoning the prophets and those sent to her? Because they don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear that their sins are separating them from God. And then he goes on to say, How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And assuredly, I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they are going to say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord when he comes into Jerusalem tri triumphantly on the donkey. But that's not what he's referring to. They're not going to see him 
until he comes the next time, the second time. They're not going to know. I mean, they're just not going to accept him. When they do see him and realize that that was the Messiah that they killed, that is when they're going to beat their breasts and go, oh, no. We killed the wrong guy. So then they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is Luke chapter 13.